All right. So hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming tonight to another Green Living Seminar presentation. Um, just note, uh, as you heard, that we are recording tonight, as we usually do. Um, and uh, eventually, we'll, we'll be able to also see this in our other presentations um, from the series up on our YouTube channel. I'm Elena Tracer, Professor of Environmental Studies here at MCLA. This semester's Green Living Seminar is organized around the theme, Greening the City. All of these presentations are free and open to the public. They take place on Wednesdays at 5.30 in room 121 of the Feigenbaum Center for Science and Innovation here at MCLA. You can find the schedule of upcoming presentations and the link to our YouTube channel at www.mcla.edu slash green living onward. And we're going to um, hear from uh, today's presenter uh, with a lecture going about 25 minutes, but then with an extended period of Q&A afterwards. So please uh, ask lots of questions. And before I turn it over to our speaker, just a quick announcement about next week's presentation. On Wednesday, February 23rd, we'll hear from Amy Hamlin, Executive Director of the Coalition for Healthy School Food with a uh, lecture titled, How and Why to Increase Plant-Based School Lunch Options in Schools. So today's presentation on transportation's responsibility to the climate, our role in decarbonization will be given by Kate Victor, Assistant Secretary and Chief of Climate and Decarbonization with the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. I so appreciate you doing this today. I'm gonna to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Kate. My pleasure. Um, thank you so much, everybody, um, for coming out. I wish I could see you. I wish I could be with you. Um, but I am really glad that this technology works. Can you see me and hear me okay? Yes, we can. It's perfect. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about sort of me and what I do here at MassDOT, and then I will go into a presentation. Um, but as I said to your very wonderful teacher this morning, I much prefer the discussion part of all of these. So I hope that we can get to Q&A, and I really hope you have lots of questions because that's what makes this really fun. Um, so yes, so I am an assistant secretary at Mass. DOT. I will explain a little bit in my presentation exactly what a State Department of Transportation is, if that is of any interest to anybody. Um, I work on lots of things, most of them having to do with travel that is not in a single occupant vehicle, as we call them in my business, an SOV. Um, so I work on walking and biking a lot on public transportation. I've done lots and lots with the MBTA over the course of my career, um, as well as with our smaller regional transit authorities. Um, if anybody is familiar with it, I was the project manager for about a decade um, for the extension of the MBTA Green Line to Somerville and Medford, close to Boston. I live in Somerville, so that is a personal, a personal project for me. Um, and increasingly, my work has sort of brought me into the climate space. And part of what I wanna talk about is how historically departments of transportation, I think at every level, really didn't see themselves as having much of a role in the climate discussions. Um, most of the ways in which we thought about kind of environmental issues, environmental stewardship was sort of within the framework of compliance and permitting and kind of what we needed to do to make sure that things we built or operated were at least to the letter of the law, not degrading the natural environment. Um, increasingly, DOTs are, are realizing their responsibility to um, think about the things that we build and run um, in terms of the carbon that they emit and the effect that that has on the climate. Um, so that's a lot of what I will be talking about today. Um, I will say to you up front um, that MassDOT, along with pretty much every other Department of Transportation, does not necessarily have neat answers yet to kind of how we deal with carbon issues. And, and I saw some of the questions that you guys had asked. They're awesome questions. I don't necessarily have neat answers to all of them, um, but I really look forward to hearing from you because this is something that um, needs a lot of smart people thinking about it. And I'm curious to know what you guys have been thinking and reading um, and we can, we can kind of talk about where we are and where I think things are going. Um, and whether I think there is reason for optimism, which was, I think was one of the questions. Um, all right, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Um, please let me know if you can see that. Yes, I can't hear or see anybody, but I'm gonna hope so. Yes, looks great. 
Yes, okay, great. Um, so as I mentioned, this is very specifically the perspective of the State Department of Transportation. And honestly, it is the perspective of one staff person at the State Department of Transportation. I am not necessarily speaking on behalf of all of MassDOT. There is no single opinion um, that would cover all of MassDOT, nor all of Massachusetts state government. Um, so these are sort of my observations and learnings over the past couple of years, um, sort of influenced by what I am kind of aware of going on around the country at other uh, transportation departments. So just quickly, um, if I were there with you, I would ask people to raise their hand and tell me if they thought they knew what a State Department of Transportation is and does. Um, but since I realize it's not something I should necessarily take for granted and it is not necessarily as fascinating to everybody else as it is to me, um, I will quickly explain. Um, so every state in America has a State Department of Transportation. Some of them have slightly different names, but basically they are normally like name of state DOT. In our case, we are mass DOT. Um, we report up to a governor, that's true in every state. Um, so the, the DOT itself is not populated and run by people who are elected, but we report to people who are elected. That is sort of the accountability between what we do and, and the voters um, and the constituents. Uh, by and large, MassDOT, like every State Department of Transportation, is funded using a lot of federal money. Um, and we can certainly talk about that, as well as state money. Um, and we are lucky in Massachusetts that we have a lot of state money for transportation, which some states really don't. Um, but we, we are fortunate to do so, which, which just sort of broadens the scope and the scale of what, of what we can do. Um, we own and operate lots of things. It's not necessarily clear. Sometimes you will see a little sign um, on a sidewalk or on a street that says MassDOT. Um, but all of the major highways, many bridges, many bike trails. We operate ferry docks. We operate the service plazas where you stop and like get a soda when you're driving somewhere. Um, lots of rail lines, typically freight, also some passenger. Um, also the MBTA and the Registry of Motor Vehicles. Uh, we do not directly operate the smaller regional transit authorities, but we help to fund them and we help to guide them. And there is a complicated relationship there, but, but they are also sort of part of our larger universe. Um, we are also involved with Massport, which runs Logan Airport and Worcester Airport, and we have a slightly lesser responsibility for all of the smaller airports that are around the state. So we are sort of everywhere and nowhere. Um, part of why we are nowhere is because in Massachusetts, the vast, vast majority of our streets are actually owned and maintained by cities and towns. I looked up the street, at least in your email address. It's a city town. It's a city street. Um, we do what we can to sort of influence how streets are used because that has kind of a direct relationship to how people get around and in turn to carbon emissions. Um, but really those decisions are made are made locally and there's there's a lot of interesting interplay between the state and cities and towns about kind of how streets should be used. Um, the last point, probably the most important one for this conversation, um, we plan a lot, we build a lot, we maintain a lot. Um, but we don't tell people how to travel. There, there aren't really laws that say you can drive this much or you can walk that much or you have to buy this kind of car or you can't buy this kind of car or you know you can only bike. Like we build infrastructure and there are various things to sort of provide incentives and disincentives around different types of travel. But there really isn't any single government entity here or anywhere else um, that is, has like very direct control over how people get around, um, which is part of what makes sort of shifting behavior related to, to carbon emissions like quite, quite tricky because there isn't kind of a clear regulatory power associated with it. So that's what a state DOT is. And so what does the term decarbonize the transportation system mean? And it's, it's a term, if you get into this field that you will hear a lot, um, I think it actually means different things to different people. I think it. I think sometimes people use it in a way that is probably not fully accurate or not fully um, realistic. So I will kind of tell you what I think it means. Um, and basically, that means you know, other than people who are walking, which I do a lot of, we are using some type of vehicle to get around. We don't use horses much anymore, but everything else, um, we are like we have some sort of conveyance that is moving us. Um, and everything that's not a bike or, you know, a non-motorized scooter runs some sort of fuel to make it go. And by and large, that is fossil fuels. You know, everything up from like the densest diesel that is used to run ships and planes to, you know, much lighter things for smaller types of vehicles. Um, the number of electric vehicles on the road in Massachusetts is still comparatively tiny. Um, 
basically everything that goes uses fossil fuels in some way, shape, or form, whether it's directly through their gas tank or through using electricity that is often produced using at least some share of fossil fuels. Um, as we all know, burning fossil fuels on the one hand has lots of positives, on the other hand has lots of negatives. One of the major negatives is the pollutants that it produces one type of which is greenhouse gases, which has become, you know, obviously the huge focus over the last five to 10 years related to climate change. Um, but there are many other pollutants and emissions and particulates that come out of diesel, come out of tailpipe emissions related to diesel um, and other types of fossil fuels, which are problematic and harmful to people and the natural environment and communities. Um, all of these are reasons why we want to try to like reduce the overall, overall carbon load that the transportation sector um, produces. I think there is often a lot of focus in this world on electric buses, and I'm happy to talk about that if people are interested. Just the, the sort of reality that I wanted to lay down early is that most transportation related emissions come from just private cars, all of our individual cars, followed by trucking which is another big problem and is also sort of directly related to um, choices that people make about sort of how we buy things and how we move things around. Um, but it's really what we call light duty vehicles, which are people's cars, the cars that sit in all of our driveways and that we drive around every day. Um, it's not travel. To my mind, travel per se is not the problem. We want people traveling. Traveling means we have access to all the things that the world has to offer us. We don't really wanna like greatly restrict people's travel. Um, although that is one way, obviously, to um, reduce emissions if you're just using fewer fossil fuels to, because you're not going around, because you're not making trips. Um, I, I tend to think that a better way to approach this is by changing out the fuels that we are using to ones that are less polluting um, and where it's appropriate to actually reducing the amount of travel in carbon emitting vehicles. Um, but when we often hear this sort of decarbonize the transportation system, I think some people really think it means like people just need to drive less. We need to make it possible for people to drive less. That is a very interesting kind of field that I will love to talk about. And I think the other whole set of people think like people are just gonna keep driving as much as they want. We don't wanna reduce driving. Driving helps people live their lives. It like increases economic activity, like all this stuff. We just want them in different types of cars. We want them in electric cars. Those two big sort of schools of thought are kind of what is right now like powering this whole discussion. Um, people tend to subscribe to one or the other and have strong feelings about which is the right one. Um, the answer as always is somewhere in the middle, um, which is why I listed those two things at the bottom there. So a couple of sort of facts, these are, these are mine, these are my observations. Hopefully they are like objectively true, um, but they are sort of where I like to like level set this whole conversation. The first thing is, we often don't think about our transportation system except the ways in which it doesn't work for us. It doesn't always work for me. It doesn't always work for anybody. We totally get that. Um, but a, a good, strong, functioning mobility system that more or less gets most people where they want to go for a reasonable price and a reasonable amount of time. I grant you those are a lot of sort of givens, but that is very important for like a healthy society in all, all ways particularly socioeconomically, but, but really in all kinds of ways. We, we really need a, a well-functioning mobility system. And that can mean a lot of different things in different places, but it is sort of, from my mind, it's like, that's the place to start. Um, historically, neither in Massachusetts or anywhere else, um, have the benefits of mobility nor the harm that comes from sort of mobility infrastructure and vehicles been evenly distributed. And you can see that if you look around our, our society or our cities or anywhere, you will see kind of the signs of that, certainly from the past and in some cases ongoing in the present. Um, the transportation sector is the single greatest and growing contributor, contributor to carbon emissions in Massachusetts, in the US and elsewhere. As I said, most of that comes from light duty vehicles and from trucking, smaller fractions from other things. Aviation is kind of a whole other world, um, but it is, it is a big challenge and we have been able to make meaningful, moving in the right direction, progress in the electricity sector to a lesser extent in the building sector. Transportation, answers in transportation have just eluded us so far, um, which is part of why we're talking about this now, part of why it's so urgent and important, part of why I'm really curious to hear what you guys have to say. Um, part of why it is so difficult to get our arms around this issue is because controlling emissions from transportation means controlling millions upon millions of individual decisions. 
and I, I need to stress this because I think this is one of the single most important points. When we regulate something like the electricity sector, you're dealing with a very small number of players, the electricity companies who are already heavily regulated, already have like lots of existing relationships with government. Transportation, yes, the government builds the infrastructure. Yes, it runs the buses. But again, the, the individual daily decisions about how people get around within the sort of framework that they are given, which I will talk about, but these are decisions we're all independently making. And there is no kind of single point of regulation or sort of single point of control, and nor should there be, um, that would allow sort of easy changes to those kinds of decisions. The way, not the electricity is easy, but it is relatively easy compared to like actually affecting individual decisions um, of these types. The other thing is when you're, when you're talking about changing mobility, whether you're talking about actually encouraging people to, to drive less or to move less, or you're trying to get them to change modes. So to switch from driving to biking or switch from driving to taking the bus or switch from walking to biking or whatever, or to buy a different type of car, a smaller car, a more fuel efficient car, an electric car. These are like material changes in people's lives that you are asking them to accept and make. And people don't like that. Change is stressful. Transportation is very personal. Again, it's not like changing the, like the delivery of your electricity. I don't know who provides my electricity. I don't care. I just want my lights to turn on. But I really care how I get around. And so it's not, it's not as simple as it is in some other fields to just sort of say wholesale, all right, everyone's now going to do something different. It's, it just doesn't work that way in transportation. And I will keep saying this because I believe this. I'm a transportation person. I'm happy to debate it. I do not believe that like significantly curtailing movement, broadly defined, travel, trips, whatever you want to call it. I don't actually, I don't think that's the answer. I think the answer is to try to figure out some other way to continue to allow people to, to do all the travel they want, to make all the trips they want, but in ways that are less damaging to the environment. Um, so the obligatory, hopefully not too boring slide about what is sort of like the, the existing regulatory context within which we exist in which we're doing all this work. Um, Massachusetts in 2008, quite a while ago now, um, passed and the governor signed the Global Warming Solutions Act, which was, if not the first, it was one of the first state level um, legally enforceable requirements for declining emissions in different sectors of the economy. Um, the Commonwealth has been sued over it and um, the Commonwealth lost, uh, essentially reaffirming that these really are legally enforceable. Um, and every five years, the Commonwealth is supposed to issue what's called a clean energy and climate plan, uh, which is the latest update is currently underway. And this is basically the place where we're supposed to kind of make real how these, like, how these reductions in emissions are going to be met. What are the policies? What are the programs? What funding is needed? Who is going to take action? Um, this new one that's in process right now is going to have to have like really meaningful policies related to transportation because transportation emissions are just not coming down the way they need to. Um, but it is very hard. It is very hard to find effective policies in transportation that are like sort of publicly palatable. Um, Massachusetts is also one of 13 states that follow the California um, energy efficiency, clean vehicle, um, EV regulations. They're stricter than the national standards. Um, we have a lot of hope that as they kind of continue to um, intensify, that they will help to like meet some of our transportation needs because they will change the rules about what types of vehicles can be sold here. Um, potentially, depending on how we decide to apply them, they could apply to EVs, they could apply to Uber, they could apply to buses. California is going very broad. It's not, it's not exactly clear which of the rules we follow, um, but certainly in a broad sense, the fact that we are part of the kind of California family of states is really helpful um, and is really important to kind of keeping us at least in the right direction on emissions. Um, so just to kind of sort of repeat something I said at the beginning, um, these are sort of truths that I think the transportation world is coming to. Um, the first is that we really do have responsibility for how the things that we build are used and what their effect is in the world. For, for a very long time, you know, transportation planners, transportation engineers, they, they built roads, they built highways, they built rail lines, they built all kinds of stuff. They thought about them in terms of like mobility, people going from here to there. In terms of development, you're opening up a new part of land that people can live in or have jobs in or build things in. Um, there was not a lot of sort of 
thought about how, about some of the negative externalities affected with it, like negative externalities that sort of come with this, which includes things like pollution. It also includes physical changes to the landscape, which can be harmful to the environment, also harmful to communities, depending on where the infrastructure is placed. Um, all of these things connect. We build roads, it affects where people build houses. Um, vice versa, communities decide not to build houses, it affects how people can get around. Um, all of these things have to be sort of thought about together. And I would encourage you guys, as people who are interested in environmental policy, and I assume public policy broadly, this is one of the greatest challenges right now because government, and I think our brains to some extent, we, we sort of like to silo issues and people are public policy experts in housing or in health or in transportation or in criminal justice or something else. All of these things need to sort of intersect more than they do now in us, you know, in order for us to be able to have like really effective policies that kind of move us as a commonwealth to where we wanna be. And to that end, there, there really is no standalone transportation solution for climate that doesn't integrally involve how we use land, where we build houses, whether we build houses, where people work, how people move around. These things like they just, they simply have to go together. And I feel like there's sort of too much conversation about the climate problem in transportation that's just to just looking at transportation without sort of understanding how all of these other things influence mobility and, and how people make the choices they do about kind of how they move around. Um, which brings me perfectly to the slide. Um, so I, I think I, I actually see um, in my friends and my colleagues, there, there is a lot of pressure and judgment that comes down on people at an individual level about kind of what transportation choices they make. I don't know if this is true among your friends too, but my friends are transportation geeks through and through and we talk about this stuff all the time. Um, you know, do people drive? Do people bike? Do people walk? Do they live in the suburbs? Do they live in the city? Do they live in a house? Do they live in an apartment? All of these things are kind of laden with value judgments. Um, and in part, they are laden with value judgments around sort of people's perceptions of what will or will not make climate change worse. Yes, it is absolutely true. Um, some individual choices come with a higher social cost than others. You know, ideally, we would all live in 100 story apartment buildings that were very efficient where we could walk everywhere. You know, that that is better from this very small perspective than, you know, living on five acres in a house by yourself that needs a road and utilities and everything. But that's not kind of how we work. And, and the reality is that people do not have perfect choice. I don't have it. You don't have it we only have sort of the choices that are presented to us by society. And we don't actually give people a whole lot of choice when it comes to things like what kinds of housing can they buy? Where is that housing? How much does it cost? Housing costs, huge, huge issue that is like, we all know this, it's forcing lots of other things in society. Um, people don't have a huge choice. They, they use the transportation that's in front of them, right? If there's a bus route and it runs when they want it to and it goes where they want it to go, they'll use the bus. If there's a road, they'll use the road. They can't go where there isn't transportation infrastructure. And they can only buy the cars that are available for sale, whether on the new market or the used market. And all of those decisions, except in these sort of small cases, somewhat related to the California stuff, those decisions are made by private automobile manufacturers who decide what they wanna sell us. So. Yes, people can make individual decisions that, that do matter at the margins, but we, we need to keep sort of coming back to and recognizing that there are huge structural forces in play that, that do limit people's individual choices, that do absolutely contribute to emissions because of these reasons. Um, and I think, we, I think we will be well served if we take some of the pressure off of individuals and kind of try to step back and see the systems that are working that kind of put individuals in the, in the positions that they get put into. Um, okay, so, you know, one, one of the things, and we can certainly talk about this, one of the things that often is talked about in this world is like, okay, how do we make it harder for people to drive? How do we make it less convenient? How do we make it more expensive? How do we make it less pleasant, like whatever, whatever word you want to use. Um, that makes sense as far as it goes, if you are looking solely to kind of limit people's travel by car. But thinking back to some of the things I've already said before, if people have no other choice, they will, they will 
you know, they will bear the cost, they will bear the inconvenience because that's the only way they have to get around and they have to get to their job or they have to get to their school or whatever. Um, if we don't give, if we, like, so there was a question actually about kind of rural, rural transportation. This, this is a, this is a huge issue in rural areas. Like, okay, we can make driving more expensive, less convenient, but people live in places where there is really no other mobility alternative. So all we kind of do in those cases is like increase the hardship on those individuals or those families without actually sort of producing the outcomes that we want. So we, we really need to, to tailor policies to, to how people live, to the world that we have. Um, policies probably should not be the same statewide, should not be the same countrywide. They need to be more granular based on the specifics in a place. Um, and we just, we need to understand how how our policies, how our policies are going to interact in the real world, and the real world is that most people have to drive. And so, how do we, how do we kind of, how do we change the emissions dynamic while still sort of recognizing that reality and, and recognizing that people kind of have to live that way in a lot of cases. Um, so, given all that, um, how do we think about our responsibility to the climate as a state department of transportation? And I will repeat that we are we are baby stepping into this issue. So, like. Nothing in my list here is going to solve the problem all by itself. I, I would not claim that. Um, but we are working more than we ever did in the past with the state level environmental and energy agencies that are, you know, they are more the experts on some of this stuff than we are. We are doing everything we can increasingly to kind of help the broad effort to encourage more people to buy electric vehicles. We, we desperately need more people driving EVs. It's sort of an all hands on deck to try to get us there. Um, we have a big effort ongoing at the MBTA, and actually we had a huge public meeting last night, specifically about buses and electrifying buses, which is a, an area of great interest to lots of people. It is important to note that, that buses as they sort of exist today in Massachusetts are not a major contributor to the GHG problem. They're, most of them are hybrid, most of them are fairly clean. They actually you know, take people out of cars, but still it's an important thing we can do. It's symbolically important and it's, it is something we are doing after a long delay are now doing quickly. Um, the question of transportation behavior, which I've been sort of hinting at, or not just hinting at, I'll throw this. We really try to focus on, on that, understanding where people are going, when they're going, how they're going, how we think they wanna go, how long we think they can sort of afford to have a take, how much they can afford for it to cost. And then the why, the why is always the sort of mystery behind all of this. Why are any of us going where we're going? Um, but if you understand all of those things a little bit better, you may have a better shot at sort of understanding where you can shift behaviors to ones that are like lighter in carbon or, or lower in carbon. Um, we generally assume that people are rational mobility actors, but given the choices that are in front of them and the choices that are in front of them are themselves not always rational um, or are not always directly related to mobility. People generally make the best choices for themselves based on cost and time. Those are the two biggest factors and what's just available. Um, but sometimes other socioeconomic, community, um, sort of self, sense of self issues also come in that sort of dictate how, how people like to get around. We also recognize that right now there was an enormous disconnect between what I think is a, a very real and authentically felt concern among many, many people in Massachusetts about climate change, about the future, about the future of their children and their grandchildren and the places they know and love and the coastline um, and sort of understanding the structural reasons why there are so many emissions being produced by transportation. Um, we drive a lot for a lot of structural reasons. Driving is a big climate concern. Kind of squaring that circle, squaring that square is, is I think a big job of all of us who are interested in these issues. And it's not an easy one. It's, it is hard, it seems, to sort of get some of these messages out there. Uh, something that I work on very particular, very much in particular, is the, the question of what we call like short trips or everyday trips. And on the next slide, I have the actual statistic, but just a huge number of, of automobile trips in Massachusetts that are made every day are less than a mile and less than three miles. Particularly those less than a mile trips, in a perfect world, those would not be made in a car. They would be made on a bus, or some sort of small shuttle bus or by walking or by biking or by scootering or by something else that we haven't thought of yet. Um, you know, we're not gonna get someone who has a 50 mile commute 
to bike. It's just not realistic. But but short trips, there is some realistic possibility there that if you provided people with safe, attractive, functional alternatives that go where they want to go, they, they might actually shift. Um, so that is something that we think about a lot. Um, and we are increasingly looking at opportunities to try to influence policies on land use and housing because we recognize how crucial those things are, both to being able to provide a functional transportation network um, and to these sort of emissions, vehicle miles traveled, climate issues. Again, they all go together. Couple of specifics, this might be a little bit boring, but um, the, yes, so here's the data on auto trips. Again, this is pre-COVID, but if anything, probably we are seeing more people driving at this point. Um, we have policies in place that re require any of our projects to include safe facilities for, for walkers and cyclists. That's a point of debate. Some municipalities don't want it, don't think it's necessary. Um, interesting questions that certainly happy to talk about. Um, we give a lot of funding to cities and towns to create better, safer streets that allow for more modes to move around more safely so that people feel like they have a viable option that's not just driving. Um, and those really try to leverage our historic downtowns. Massachusetts is blessed. The vast majority of Massachusetts was settled prior to the invention of the automobile. Um, so we do have a lot of walkable areas and, and dense areas where people can do a lot of what they need within a relatively small radius, depending on how their lives are structured. Um, so again, we're sort of testing the, the theory that if you make those places even better for walking and biking and short bus trips that, that people might use those modes. Um, lots of work being done for off-road bike trails, walking trails. Those obviously have a major recreational component, which is awesome, um, but they can also be meaningful pieces of transportation infrastructure. I, I walk on a, an urban trail to get to the subway every morning. Like It wasn't necessarily built to be a transportation thing, um, but it does that just as well as it does you know, give someone a chance to walk their dog or you know, get out and see some green um, either way. And we, like everybody, are just trying to understand what people are going to do now or next. Travel behavior has been so scrambled. All of the long-term assumptions about kind of how people commuted, the times they commuted, where they were going, why they were going, all of those things have changed with COVID. Um, we are trying to sort of understand it as everybody is, predict the future, which is very difficult. It's always difficult, it's especially difficult now. Um, so that's, that's just sort of an ongoing both area of interest and, and something that we're trying to do to, to be responsible kind of stewards of the transportation system. And that's it, that's me. Um, feel free, I will say this again, but please feel free to reach out, don't be shy. I love hearing from people. And, um, and yeah, I will stop sharing. That, that was my presentation. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we will uh, turn over to uh, questions from the audience. And I, Kate, you can hear me again, right? I can. Yep. Perfect. Fantastic. So the microphone is now up here. So um, I will be happy to repeat any questions um, for Kate to field if you have them. Or as you know, if you know me, I always have a long list. So <laughs> anyone want to go first or shall I? Great, William. As the Department of Transportation in Massachusetts, uh, I know like there's a lot of buses and train planes and such, but have there been some other alternatives like maybe trams? Has that been a good idea for trams? So yeah, so the question is, so the OT in Massachusetts uh, there's plans for buses and uh, train expansion, but what, anything else like trams or anything else along those lines? No, not at this point. Um, the the modes that we have are are by and large sort of the ones that we stick with. We're certainly not opposed to something. We have experimented over the years with other things, but we we tend to keep coming back to the tried and true. Um, but if there were if there were some new technology or something that we haven't tried that could be appropriate for a particular place, we certainly wouldn't be close to it. It would just need to be something that would be kind of feasible for the, the problem it was trying to solve. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
So, um, um, did, were you able to hear that, Kate, or shall I repeat? Just, no, yeah, if it, just I got so, like words here or there. Yeah, um, and, I, and also, please, uh, you can help. All right. Um, so <laughs> you hear that? Uh, Massachusetts so. uh, private sector uh, collaboration, um, subsidizing transport, uh, transit management associations, uh, bringing together public and private um, institutions to in enhance mobility choices, hospitals, universities, etc. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, so generally, what we call TMAs, transportation management associations, are, are exactly that. They're they're private nonprofit collaborations, usually with a bunch of area employers who kind of want to fill in some transportation gap somewhere that's probably not like big enough to be something that like a big transit agency would fill, um, but it's kind of an identified need. Um, I think so. There there are many in Massachusetts. There are at least prior to COVID, there were there were a bunch being formed. I don't I don't know that they're continuing to, but I think what we have found in general is that whether it's being provided by a TMA or you know, an official transit agency or by a town or whatever, trying to provide something that looks like public transportation, whether it's a bus or a shuttle, once you get very far outside of a core, it could be the core of Boston, it could be the core of Springfield, it could be the core of like, you name it, it gets really, really tough. And I, I think that a lot of us want to believe that, that there is a world in which people will travel long distances without cars, that they'll take the commute, like, They'll get to the commuter rail on their end, they'll take the commuter rail on the other end, they'll take a shuttle bus that will take them to their office park or their downtown or wherever their job is. There certainly are such people, um, but there just aren't a ton of them. And like public transportation of any form in the suburbs or the exurbs is incredibly expensive and just tends not to succeed. And a lot of it is about travel times. It's just, it's really difficult for those kinds of trips to compete even with what may be a trafficy, unpleasant drive. Um, and I just I think it's this is where it's useful for kind of all of us to think about ourselves and like, would we do that trip to get to work every morning? Would we get up and walk 10 minutes to the subway and wait in the cold and take the subway and take the train and take a bus? Like it's pretty hard. Um, but there are some TMAs that are operating in more dense urban areas that I think have had success. Um, particularly there, the one in the seaport area of Boston has has been extremely active. Um, so it really depends on the, the setting and the context. Yeah. You're talking about the train, right? Um, so the question is, uh, any status update um, regarding um, a train route, either um, Pittsfield, Boston, or Pittsfield uh, North or South, sorry, Pittsfield South to New York? So I'm actually not working on any of those projects. I know there's a lot of work going on. You know, the look, MassDOT, Connecticut DOT, Vermont DOT, there are a lot of what were once passenger rail lines or in some cases once freight or currently are still freight lines. 
there's a lot of study and planning work to going on going on now to kind of figure out, you know, are there places where passenger service really could be successful and are there cross border collaborations that could really work and um, I, I'm not sort of an expert on it, but I know that there's there's a lot of interest in it right now and it, it certainly has um, interesting potential and I, th I think it's something to just kind of watch and see how the, the planning work kind of keeps evolving. <laughs> yeah, so this is a, a question about an article actually that I sent you that another student brought up and this is a question brought by a different person um, <laughs> about that road that charges the cars while it's driving on it and yep. is there is that something that's likely to um, yeah uh, be built out further. Um, so it's called inductive charging it so it's something that we've looked at for buses. Um, the the conclusion that that we've come to, and this this may change. This is like a really quickly evolving world. But the the conclusion that we've come to, at least so far, is that both for buses and for private cars, like point chargers, sort of like like gas stations, like that seems to to be what makes more sense. Um, but I agree, there are all sorts of cool things. And the the Regional Transit Authority in Worcester experimented with overhead charging. Um, there's the charging in the road. There 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 are different things, and I think the the world is still changing on this. I will say the the bipartisan infrastructure bill that passed a couple months ago that we're still sort of like processing through, but it includes a lot of money specifically for electric vehicle chargers. And I, I think that will probably kind of tip the scales in favor of, of point chargers because there will be billions of dollars put into that network over time across all the states, but you never know. Um, and it's, it's, very, it's, it's fun because it's still fluid in some ways. I actually wanna follow up on that. Um with a couple of things that uh, have been brought up by the students and we had discussed before. So one is um, with regards to rural communities. So is the DOT then would be the institution that would be rolling out electric charging infrastructure in rural areas? Actually, that's, the, that's part one. Is that is that true or um, how does that work? So it, it actually it entirely depends. Um, most of our work is on the highways. So. So yes, to the extent that there are highways, um, the I I think to, to ultimately be successful and effective, you know, it's going EVs are going to need chargers all over the place, right? They're going to need them at the municipal level. They're going to need them on highways. They're going to need them in parking lots. Like so, there will be work to be done by everybody, by private businesses that own land, by institutions like universities, by cities and towns that own public land, and by us at the kind of highway regional corridor level. Um, so yes, but also with lots of other people. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then my other follow-up question is again about the sort of infrastructure um, funding and um, relating back to something you brought up before about kind of uh, sort of holistic planning um, in your department around how uh, decisions are made um, by your department, how they influence, you know, uh, or they're related to those with um, regarding housing and uh, development and kind of wider societal externalities. So there's, you know, press on what some of the concerns are with sort of ex expanding highways and how that also leads to further emissions, right? And so are those conversations going on around sort of this infrastructure um, funding that's coming and hoping to not uh, result in increased uh, emissions as a result of the new infrastructure that may be put into place? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. And it's it's a big national conversation. I mean, certainly, so in Massachusetts, we, we don't build we don't build new highways. Like we're we're done. We've been done for a long time. Um, which is part of why I like working here. I would not want to work somewhere where we were still building a lot of highways. Um there are a lot of states that are still building highways, and there is definitely a national debate bubbling about, you know, should should this infrastructure bill kind of should the federal government kind of tip its hand in one direction or the other and say, we really don't want state built states building more highways or should it do what it's, it's sort of traditionally done, which is said like, here's states, here's your money, you guys use it the way you sort of think is right. Um, it's, you know, there's a, there are arguments on both sides, I guess. Um, but I will say, even though we don't build highways here, we, you know, anytime, anytime you do something to a road, you are conceivably maybe encouraging more people to drive on it. So it is, it, 
even without big highways, there are still subtler issues that can relate to, you know, are we doing things to like encourage too much emissions by a driving, but it is, um, fortunately, we're not doing, we're not doing big road work, but there's, there's interesting work going on by NGOs to kind of figure out if states invest in infrastructure money this way, what would the emissions profile look like? If they did it this way, what would the emissions profile look like? So it's, it's an ongoing debate, just not as much here. Thanks. Um, yeah, and so I can't actually, so it doesn't actually matter if you take your masks off or not uh, in terms of my hearing you and we have to keep our masks on. So feel free because Kate still can't hear you. So go ahead. So yeah, so um so how do we live with that dilemma? We we could spend you know millions of dollars improving that credit system to the only use of the region because they can achieve environmental goals through the motor power they have that's no longer creating a profit to the lower gravity. All right, so the idea being that um there seems to be a movement um in uh, auto and power generation towards um, electric options, uh, investments are going that way. So it's electrification um, and this allows for personal mobility uh, through non-emitting um, uh, options. But then is there a, a dilemma um, with um, not then uh, solving this problem by offering mass transit? People wouldn't then maybe use mass transit, will it suffer, will it just, uh, um, something that we should be concerned about. I mean, I, th I think there is always, obviously there's always a, a, I don't even know exactly what the right word is, but there's always a tension between public transit and private driving. There, there always has been. Um, the places where public transportation is like, is really genuinely competitive with, with driving tend to be the densest, most urban places where driving is like the biggest drag. And the, the destinations are close enough to each other that a bus or a subway can can deliver lots of people quickly, cheaply. Like that's that's what transit does well. It delivers lots of people at the same time to the same place in a in a kind of dense, in a dense area. Um, you know, and I I just my personal opinion, those are the places where if you were if if government was going to look to kind of more intentionally shift people away from driving and you see this in other cities around the world like those are the places where you do it because there are viable other options i think that sort of coming back to the tma question public transit in in low density suburban exurban rural areas is is unlikely to be successful so that's where you're more you know your your bet should be more on electric vehicles for personal travel um, maybe shuttle buses and kind of like dense villages and cores where people are trying to make sort of similar type type trip patterns um, but it is the, the tension between driving and transit exists, whether or not you're dealing with electric vehicles, but there are places where I think transit is just unlikely to succeed, where we really do need to focus on electric vehicles and charging infrastructure to support them. Yeah. Can you put your mask back on? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Okay, um, so we had a mass in motion um, shared streets program here in North Adams, and mm -hmm. is that likely to continue? Yeah, so that's actually my program. I run that. So we have a um, we have a grant round that's actually open right now. Um, that's open for two more weeks or so. 
Um, and then we expect to do hopefully another one in the summer. And then I'm not sure after that, but, but yes, the program has been just like cosmically popular and we hope to continue it if we possibly can. Uh, I think hooray, I remember the that. response to that. <laughs> <laughs> Please apply. <laughs> electric vehicles when the grid is still primarily sourced like um, powered by fossil fuels and natural gas. Okay, yeah, so a big question. Um, so, um, right, so we know uh, greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles are a problem. So is uh, transitioning to electric vehicles the solution when we know that the grid is still largely powered by fossil fuels uh, generating electricity? I mean, I, I guess I would add, that's a question for all of us, right? Like many, there's very few, there are very few like big decisions in public policy that don't involve trade-offs. I, I guess my, my ideal answer was you do both at the same time. You, you, you know, you make your grid better while you're simultaneously trying to like encourage more people to buy electric vehicles. Neither of those processes will happen perfectly smoothly the way you want them to with the timing, right? Like it's, it's already been lumpy and slow and it will continue to be that. But I, I think it's, it's a complex series of trade-offs, right? And that's that's what all of these things are. We have we seem to have sort of decided as a society that that you know trying to clean the light duty personal vehicle fleet is a really, really important piece of the climate challenge. And certainly the analysis I have seen suggests that that is true. I will also say that I both probably from the government side and also from the advocate side, I have often seen people just sort of ignore the question of like electricity generation and just sort of focus on like the, the point vehicle. It's like, well, this vehicle is clean. It's like, well, yes, that's true. But you have to think about where the power is coming from. But but ultimately, you know, for a lot of reasons, we need we need more renewables. So hopefully they will kind of work together slowly, but it is, it is a tension, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. How you would substitute electric power for gasoline in the gas tax context is being directly confronted now. Uh, the American Trucking Association, for example, welcomes the idea of looking at a formula where they can pay for their electric vehicles via a system that can work with the utility to come up with a kilowatt hour fee that could be a substitute for the gas tax. Uh, a large percentage, which is one time the whole highway program was supposed to pay for by gas. Now it's a significant percentage. So you've got to substitute with revenue in order to go forward. But what is happening now is we're seeing for the first time a serious conversation about how you substitute the providing of moving vehicles by the people in the way that captures some of the revenue or providing, you know, paying for the larger bill of transportation. So this is, uh, you know, it's an early part of the discussion, but it's significant. Uh, the other interesting thing that happened is when they were negotiating the bill that just passed in the infrastructure, so a lot of money was put in the bill early on for charging stations, and that money was cut back significantly. It's just not that there's short change left there, but there still is uh, much less money to make the uh, transition, which would be absolutely necessary, or face the question of how uh, electric vehicles will be powered. Will you do it at home? Will you keep the gas stations in place? Will the rail system jump in and substitute it? I mean, these are, I think, significant uh, policy issues that are going to have a lot to do uh, because of the, uh, because it's got to be a practical solution. And I think we've done a really good job of stressing that our solution is going to be practical. So it, it's just like we should keep a heads up on this. I mean, this is going to be a big issue of how quickly these policies are, you know, happen, and how much impact the DOT will have the responsibility to, in many respects, in the Department of Energy and laying out these systems to be able to exist. So, so lots of lots of, lots of details. Um, thanks. So we are getting close to the end here. I think if there is one more quick question, we could take it. Um, 
before we wrap up, or if not, great, we got one more. William, go for it. Are you for the future? Oh, what a great ending question. Thanks, William. Are you hopeful for the future? Well, I'm a skeptic by nature. Um, am I hopeful for the future? You know, that I, I will answer that in a couple of ways. It's when I meet with colleagues who work in housing or who work in buildings or who work in sort of land use, everybody always says like, my, my field is the one that's hardest to decarbonize. Like you guys, you guys do it. Like it's easy for you. You guys should really focus on it because there's like no way. We're all like, no, no, no. Like transportation is the hardest. I, I think my ideal and like nobody elected me anything. So this is just, I, I think in some ways that maybe the easiest way to do this is to like not think about it as sectors and have sort of economy wide ways of thinking about it because it is much cheaper and easier to get carbon reductions out of the electricity sector, easy for me to say, than it is out of transportation. But we're, because we're sort of in this framework where we're thinking about them in, in kind of silos, you know, ch making major changes in transportation is it's going to be tough and it's going to be expensive and it's going to be unpopular. Um, I, and I, it's going to take a lot of kind of communal will and communal willingness to to change how we do things. And that's tough. People don't like change in general. People in Massachusetts really don't like change. Um, but yes, I think so. I, I think that it's very slow. It's very incremental, like everything is. But we're seeing it. The, the EV money is a big deal. Um, you know, more and more auto manufacturers are, are orienting themselves more towards EVs. There's, there's a ton of work to do, but I am, I am seeing enough like small signs of change that I am, I am, I am guardedly hopeful. But I, I think for all of us, it's, you know, my daughter is 16. A lot of this is going to fall on their generation. We, we all just have to be willing to make, to make, not make sacrifices, but just make change in how we do things. And maybe, you know, some of that's going to be expensive, whether it's changing out our oil burners or buying new cars or whatever, and kind of figuring out how that happens is, is really hard and tricky. Um, but yes, I have reason for hope. Well, thank you very much um, for your presentation, for all the answering all the questions, and um, I really do appreciate you being here. I want to thank everyone for coming and for your good questions. Come back next week. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll sign off. Thank you, Kate. Thank you guys so much. It's really fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me.